Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends. I'm very, very happy to welcome you to this final session of this year's World Health Summit. Of course, I shouldn't just say good afternoon because people are watching from all around the world. And I'm so pleased that uh, you are interested in what's going to be a really exciting final session. As you know, this final session will focus on a new WHO I don't know what to call it, initiative uh, uh, way of working, which is the WHO Council on the Economics of Health for All. And uh, we are delighted to discuss with you here the intentions of this council, but also the work it's already done and the work it is going to do, last not least, in view of a number of really important meetings coming up like the Rome summit of the G20. So again, a very, very big welcome. The way we're going to approach this session is that we will first hear from the patron of uh, this council, the Prime Minister of Finland, Sanna Marin. Then we will hear from Dr. Tedros, his intention, why he established this council. And then we will hear from the chair of the council, Mariana Matsukato. After that, we will be joined by some additional council members to have a discussion and to give you a feel for all the issues at stake and how the council uh, intends to approach them. And after we've had our discussion, uh, the Prime Minister and Dr. Tedros will give some closing remarks. So it's my truly great pleasure now to ask the Prime Minister of Finland, uh, Sanna Marin, to come to the stage and as the patron of the WHO Council on the Economics of Health for All. Please, Prime Minister. Thank, thank you so much, Director General Dr. Tetros, Professor Matsukato, Professor, Professor Kikpush, dear participants, dear friends. I wish to congratulate the World Health Organization and Director General Tetros. The Council on Economic of Health for All was a missing piece and very much needed. As the patron of the Council, I would like to thank Professor Matsukato and the members of the Council for your dedication, inspiration and vision. The Council works at the intersection of economics and health. The COVID-19 pandemic has shown how health and economy are linked to each other. The dramatic consequences of the pandemic for individual households as well as economies have been profound. Many consequences are not even known yet. We now understand that health budgets are not only an expense. Health budgets are much more an investment, an investment that makes societies and economies stronger more resilient and more equal. We need to rethink our policies globally and locally. The question is how to make us collectively and as individuals, societies better prepared. How to become more resilient for future crises and threats. We need to act on several tracks simultaneously. We need to reform the global preparedness and response mechanisms. We need to make the world health organization stronger. We need to invest in national cap cap capacities and resilience. We need to ensure equitable access to essential countermeasures. We must work on several tracks in order to make a real leap forward. We need to improve what is already in place, but we also need new approaches. These include an international instrument, a new funding tool to support capacities for health security at national, regional and global levels. Our view must be holistic on what needs to be done. A broader societal approach is called for. A good society and well-functioning economy needs investments in research, social protection, education and health systems. Investing in gender equality and women's economic empowerment is very important. We need prevention and more health and well-being. The whole of government and whole of society approach is way to get there. 
Together, these investments drive progress and rebuild better and resilient societies for all. In addition, these investments contribute to global public goods for health and well-being. I believe that this is the way to build societies based on trust. Without trust, a society is not resilient. With trust, our democracies are stronger. This is what we have learned in Finland throughout our history. Finland has cons constantly promoted collaboration across sectors and health in all policies. We know this is not enough in the face of important transformations going on due to climate change, demography, urbanization or new technologies. These changes touch upon many sectors. We need to see the link between economy, health, environment and well-being. This is what the economy of well-being is all about. The pandemic has had a big impact on health economies and societies around the world. This impact should not have come as a surprise. For years, experts at the, and the World Health Organization have been warning us about the need to be better prepared for large-scale health threats and emergency. They have warned about the gaps in national cap capacities and capabilities. We have failed to fully understand the importance of the link between human, animal and the environment and health security and well-being. Furthermore, in many countries, choices in politics and the economy have led to a deeper inequalities as well as to under underinvestment in health and social protection. It is clear that people in difficult situations have been hit hardest by COVID-19 pandemic. Inequitable access to vaccine is worsening the mistrust in the global political environment. At the same time, the pandemic has shown that with the right approach, it is possible to protect the vulnerable, to address inequalities, as well as safeguard both health and the economy. Taking the lessons learned from those who have succeeded better can help us guide forward. We need to find the courage to make bold changes before we are swept away by new challenges. This is my key message today. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Prime Minister. We could ask for no better patron for this uh, Council on New Economic Thinking. Many of you know that uh, Finland has been at the forefront of thinking about uh, what it means to develop an economy of well-being. It has taken that agenda to the European Union. It was at the forefront of taking the health in all policies approach to the World Health Organization and to many other uh, member states of the WHO. So uh, this innovation capacity of Finland, the willingness to think forward and move forward, and the fact that Finland has many, many strong women uh, was uh, a reason to uh, approach uh, uh, the Prime Minister to be patron of uh, this council and we are delighted that uh, she agreed. Thank you very much and it's my pleasure to now ask Dr. Tedros to share with us uh, why this council was established and what his hopes are that it will deliver. Please Dr. Tedros. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ilona. Uh, Your Excellency, Prime Minister Sana Marin of Finland. Your Excellency, Minister Martin Guzman, uh, Professor Mazzucato, uh, dear colleagues and friends. Good afternoon and thank you all for joining us today. First of all, I would like to thank Her Excellency, Prime Minister Sana Marin, for her leadership as patron of the WHO Council on the Economics of Health for All. 
Kitos. And I would also like to acknowledge Ilona Kikbush, Vera Songwe, and Jayati Ghosh, who are all members of the council. We're very pleased to have assembled such a distinguished group of diverse experts from around the world. And my special thanks to Professor Mazzucato for agreeing to chair the council and for her leadership. Why have we created the Council on the Economics of Health for All? The answer goes back to the consultation to the constitution of WHO written more than 70 years ago, which affirms that the, I quote, enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of health is one of the fundamental rights of every human being, end of quote. Since then, that affirmation has been reinforced by the commitment to health for all at the Almata Declaration uh, Conference at, of 1978, and most recently by the high level political declaration on universal health coverage made at the UN General Assembly just two years ago. While progress towards these lofty goals has been made, it's not nearly sufficient. There remain unacceptable gaps within and between countries. The COVID-19 pandemic has thrown a harsh spotlight on these inequities. It's clear that achieving health for all demands that we reach beyond WHO's traditional counterparts in the health sector, including to those responsible for making national economic policies. We can no longer see health as a cost, but as an investment that's the foundation of productive, resilient, and inclusive economies. While we have many great professionals working in WHO, we have formed this council for a unique purpose that requires unique expertise and a unique perspective. Our aims are not modest. We want to fundamentally change the way that international financial institutions, national leaders, and their finance ministries think about and value health. We want to foster and promote innovations and actions that transform local and global health systems and to accelerate progress towards the health related targets in the sustainable development goals, including universal health coverage. We task the council with coming up with new ideas that are not only bold and innovative, but also practical to guide and support countries as they invest in health in order to achieve the greatest benefit for their populations. And we ask it to consider a wide range of policies addressing innovation, industry, employment, and environmental policies, and to reflect on growth that's inclusive of health and well being for countries in all income levels. I very much appreciate the Council's work so far. This includes developing a new vision and narrative on the value of health, its work on health innovation, published this past June, and the new policy brief we're releasing today on financing health for all. We welcome the council's formulation that we need a radical redirection in economic thinking for global health. It's time to move away from thinking of health as a component of the economy and instead look at how the economy can support the societal goal of health for all. This new finance brief shows that neither existing market 
mechanisms with their focus on short-term returns, nor development funds alone are sufficient to achieve health for all. They do not provide the global public goods on which we all depend, such as vaccines, nor do they address the major inequities undermining equitable access. The Council is proposing bold, concrete actions for governments and multilateral organizations in three major areas, creating fiscal space, the direction of investment, and the governance of public and private finance. This does not just mere, mean more money. It means making the better, smarter, and longer term investments that are needed to achieve health for all. And as the council itself says, more finance and better finance, meaning quantity and quality, better quantity and, and quality. Thank you again to our patron, the prime minister for accepting to lead this council, which is the first of its kind in WHO. And I would also like to use this opportunity to thank Ilona the idea of um, having a chief economist in WHO was proposed by her and her good friend, uh, Alan Donnelly. So thank you so much for these crazy ideas. And in WHO then based on their ideas, we started from having this council first and then move into the chief economist, which we will do ultimately. And also my thanks to Professor Mazzucato and all council members for their ongoing work. All the council members, by the way, are women. And I was with Mariana when people asked us, why all women? And we both same time <laughs> answered, why not? And nobody followed with any other question. <laughs> so, um, and um, I hope uh, some men now are willing to join them as observers, still limited. <laughs> <laughs> the independent analysis and evidence they produce can inform the decision making of both heads of state and ministers of finance as they strive to make the best policy choices for health. I really believe in this council and I hope we will make progress and realize what the world promised health for all at the end of 1940s more than 70 years ago, we should make it happen. It's time to act because this pandemic has shown us how health is central. I don't think we need to debate on this and the world it should make it happen. So thank you so much again. And Ilona, back to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tedros, and uh, you uh, will now understand why I underlined uh, when I spoke about the patron of uh, asking the prime minister of a country with very strong women uh, to act as a patron of this council. It is now my great, great pleasure to ask uh, Professor Mariana Matsukato, who is the chair of the council, to uh, speak to us and give us uh, further understanding of what the work of the council has been, what its narrative is, what it hopes to achieve. Finally, today, I was able to meet Mariana in person because uh, the uh, pandemic has not allowed us to do so before. And that's been a wonderful experience. We've really been able to hug one another. And, uh, but uh, I do want to underline that uh, uh, you have a very, very special person uh, speaking to you today. Mariana Matsukato has on many occasions when there have been rankings of economists been ranked as one of the world's leading economists. 
uh, she advises heads of state, she advises the G7, the G20, many other organizations, and uh, we are incredibly proud that uh, she agreed uh, to chair this uh, WHO Council, bring her experience, bring her creativity, and bring her knowledge to this enormous challenge of anchoring health in a totally new way in the context of the economies of states but also in terms of the global economy and global public goods. So Mariana, the lectern is yours. Thank you, Ilona, my fellow council member. And it's true, when you see someone who you've been Zooming and Zooming and teaming with for such a long time, you, you give an extra hug. <laughs> and um, I've been told that the reason why COVID uh, you know, was so strong in Italy is we hug and touch a lot. <laughs> so anyway, I shouldn't say that at a World Health Conference. So um, first of all, thank you so much, Prime Minister Marine, for being our, our patron. I was going to say patron saint, but our patron. And I don't think it's a coincidence that uh, you're a woman. In fact, some of the leaders across the world that have put well-being at the center of their economy, as you have, in that whole of government approach, where well-being becomes almost normalized. It's not just this funky little thing on the side. They're all women, aren't they? So, you know, in New Zealand, in Finland, in Scotland, in Iceland. And so anyway, thank you so much for agreeing to be our patron. And we really hope that we can interact with you much more. And thank you so much, Dr. Tedros, for being a huge inspiration. We even, when we said, why not? I think there was a word in between the why and not, that we both muttered under our breath, uh, but we cannot say that out loud. Um, or at least we could say it in Italian. It always sounds better when we swear in Italian as we did over dinner the other night because Dr. Tedros does speak Italian. Um, and, and as has been said so eloquently by both Prime Minister Marin, Ilona and Dr. Tedros, really the goal here is not to start from scratch, right? There's been plenty of great studies that have in fact linked health and the economy. The problem is not only that they're often not heard in this whole issue about health being an investment, not a cost, requiring kind of long run and visionary thinking instead of just always seeing it as an expenditure and some sort of trade off. We spend more on health, maybe a bit less in education. No, that's the wrong thinking. But we need to go beyond just making that, um, that link, which is a very strong link. We should make that link. The problem has been that we have often said, oh yeah, invest in health, because it's also really important for a more inclusive economy. Yes, but what we have to also say at the same time in a moonshot kind of way, that it's health for all, that is the goal, and then redesigning the economy in order to serve that goal is the whole point. And if we don't do that, we just come back to this kind of siloed thinking. And so what does it actually mean in terms of designing the economy that's the whole point of this council. Um, you know, what does it mean for how we govern innovation, right? Governing innovation with common good metrics in terms of how to also really foster collective intelligence, which means being able to really design intellectual property rights in such a way that they help create value and not become a monopolistic kind of rent-seeking extraction of value tool. What does it mean for how we direct finance? We can't just fill the system up with liquidity and hope for the best as we did after the financial crisis, where something like 80% of the finance that was created went back to the financial sector, finance, insurance, and real estate. So directing finance to the real economy, but especially in real places that improve global health systems, but also partnerships between public and private actors that are properly designed in order to foster the kind of goals we have. And by the way, a lot of you know, the issues there is that in the past, at least the conditions attached <laughs> to finance from different types of organizations, including our friends at the IMF and the World Bank, were precisely those problematic conditionalities that made many countries around the world have weaker health systems, weaker uh, uh, public administrations, because they were often kind of blanket conditions around uh, cutting our, our, our public uh, uh, debt as though that was like some sort of voodoo um, area as opposed to really strengthening through public and private sector investment our real ability to structure our welfare state but also our ability to govern and produce 
the things that we need in our economy. And so kind of revisiting that whole kind of Washington consensus conditionality is one of the things that we do in our new policy brief on finance that Dr. Tedros uh, spoke about, which I'll get to in a minute. Another area, of course, that's really important if it's design the economy for the goal of health for all is what does it mean for outcomes-based budgeting and participatory budgeting, which is something quite interesting, often done by the way at the city level. There's something about cities that I think is really interesting because there's smaller places. And if you look globally at what mayors are doing around the world, they have an ability to experiment, right? That kind of experimentation, trial and error that we also require in terms of redesigning our economies. We're actually launching next week uh, another council hosted by UN Habitat, my institute at UCL and LSE cities, bringing together mayors across the world to, um, to think together, you know, what did it mean when you were on the front line of the COVID crisis in terms of new tools that were needed and how can we kind of scale up those lessons? Um, what does it mean for procurement? Procurement is a huge chunk of government budgets. Um, in the UK where I live, the whole innovation budget is 10 billion. And just the procurement budget of the Ministry of Transport is 40 billion. Um, and across the board, Department of Health, Department of Education, Department of Defense, you start using procurement. So government as purchaser to be really bold around public goals, including public health goals and health being this cross-cutting well-being measure that we require to build a strong economy. And you've just massively increased your innovation budget, right? If it actually is about innovating and experimenting for important new uh, social goals. And also another area that we could think about today where there's you know, trillions being poured into the system, kind of too little, too late on the back of the COVID pandemic with recovery funds. What does it mean, for example, to have uh, conditionalities linked to these grants and loans, recoveries and bailouts that really have important public goals at the center? And in this case, health for all goals at the center. Um, by the way, on that, it's really interesting. Some countries have done this recently. There's really different you know, heterogeneity around the world around this kind of willingness to put conditionality to foster more dynamic symbiotic public-private partnership. Just as an example, France, um, which is not perfect in every way, but just this one thing was interesting they did. Um, they put some conditions attached to the loans, sorry, the bailout the recovery loans that were given to two uh, 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 Renault and Air France. They had to commit to reducing their carbon emissions in the next five years in order to get one penny, one euro uh, out of the government. So there's something much wider there about saying, instead of again, flooding the system with liquidity or just bailouts and loans to different sectors that might need help during a pandemic, what about again, having measures around carbon reduction and a green transition and health for all at the center of that new social contract. And this is very much goes to the center of everything that we're doing in the, um, in the council, because we always begin all our conversations by reminding ourselves that the economy and even the, the so-called market, which we all use that word a bit lazily, right? The market is not business. The market is an outcome and the market, out, well, market outcomes are uh, results of how we govern all the different institutions that create value in the economy, how we govern our public entities. Are they there just to fix markets or can they actually create and co-shape the economy? How we govern the private sector. There's different corporate governance mechanisms. And by the way, Finland should be applauded <laughs> because Finland, as well as other Scandinavian countries, have a stakeholder governance model of corporate governance, where they're not just maximizing shares, but truly not just with the talk at places like Davos about stakeholder value, truly concretely have a mechanism within the company governance to have different voices at the table, including labor unions and the labor voice, which is very important in an era of capitalist history where the labor share of global GDP is at the lowest it's ever been, the profit share is at one of the highest it's ever been, right? And that's not, believe me, because one part of the economy, the economy became smarter than the other. This is partly due to that extraction effect that I talked about before. So remembering that the economy is an outcome of all these decisions, how we govern the different public, how we govern the different private, and especially how we govern their relationship is so important in a sector like health, which is full of public, private, philanthropic funds, right? And remembering that, you know, just to say, oh, we're gonna partner and that's good in and of itself. Well, that's never been true of marriage. Right, a lot of marriages don't end up too well and, and no one would say just partnering for the sake of it is a good thing. And if you speak to any biologist, of which I'm sure there's some in the room, they would never just use the word ecosystem in a neutral way. 
they would say ecosystem. Is it parasitic? Is it predator prey? Is it symbiotic? Is it mutualistic? So being able to actually define and measure, just like we try to do with ESG metrics, the partnership. What kind of partnership are we constructing? And let's get rigorous about having the best partnerships. Before I forget, let me just read out the names of our wonderful uh, women in this council. And yes, we're thinking about letting some in. I think Gordon Brown is on our waiting list somewhere and maybe others uh, like Mario Monti. No. That's sort of a joke. We are more than open to having all sorts of wonderful uh, people. They just have to be great economists. So we have Sinead Fiseha, we have Jayati Ghosh, Vanessa Huang, Stephanie Kelton, Ilona, who's sitting there, uh, Zelia Media Profeta Daluz, Kate Rayworth, Vera Songwe. And what's, what's incredible is that these are all women coming with very different types of expertise, but also distributed across uh, the globe, and this is especially where we want to open up. We want to make sure that we are constantly listening, not just in our um, you know uh, uh, meetings, but also in terms of the representation in the council. We this is our first year, so we just began in uh, May. We've written two briefs: one on innovating for the common good, and one on financing uh, the common good. And the really interesting thing is, we're hoping that this first year is full of big ideas. And I think I'm almost done with my time, so I don't know how much, no, I'm good. Um, but so big ideas of which I'll give you a bit of reflection on those just in a second, and I'll be super brief. But the second year is gonna be the fun year. This is where we turn into a mean, lean fighting machine, hopefully, where we want to implement some of the ideas. So that kind of coalition of the willing, and we want to, of course, start with Finland, <laughs> uh, but especially around the world. And again, this might be at the city level, the regional level, the national level, the multinational level, to start really implementing some of the ideas, whether it be about outcomes-based budgeting, new forms of partnerships between large pharmaceutical companies, public entities, small biotech companies. What would it look like to really share not only the risks, but also the rewards, really at the project level, designing new projects that um, embed that. Um, anyway, so the second year, so in about a year's time, we're gonna be really kind of looking for partners around the world, but we really felt that the first year was the moment to think big, we need new economic theory. Keynes, a famous economist you'll all know, had this wonderful quote. He said, practitioners on the ground who think they're kind of just getting the job done are often slaves of defunct economic theory. So kind of reinventing the economics, but also doing practice-based theorizing, which means you also have to be humble that when you try to implement it, you admit it's gonna be messy. There's gonna be lots of trial and error. What was the quote you told me, Dr. Tadros, last night from um, in Ethiopia? They say that when you, what was it? When you stop experimenting, you're dead? Tell me, it was good. Only dead people don't make mistakes, right? So it's such a good quote. <laughs> Thank you. So this is a huge point, by the way, because whereas venture capitalists can brag about all the mistakes they made, Kleiner Perkins, venture capital company that invested in Genentech and admitted that in order for each success, they need eight or nine failures, as soon as civil servants make mistakes, bang, front page of the Daily Mail. So something about being willing to take risks, to experiment and to use our platform as a platform of experimentation around these big ideas is really the biggest goal of the council. Just lastly, the big ideas that we're trying to foster in our work and the two policy briefs that we've put out, the first one on innovation, the second one on finance, which is um, being launched today in light of the meeting of the 2020, 20 finance ministers and 20 health ministers on Friday, the big ideas that we're trying to look at is, there, there's four, one is around measurement. How do we value and measure health for all? How do we understand health for all as a key objective of economic activity, as I was talking about, and well-being, and fundamental to the assessment, to the evaluation of, of how countries design and prioritize policies and promote the common good. So how do we both measure it in terms of a key indicator, uh, you know, beyond GDP, which we all know is quite limited, but also how do we evaluate bold policies around health for all ex post outside of the standard kind of cost benefit analysis, net present value calculations, which by the way, would have stopped the moon landing from the beginning had they done a cost benefit analysis. Second capacity, a public sector leading towards health for all. How do we actually better capture the critical role of public sector leadership and capacity in generating health through action on social determinants and strengthening its dynamic capabilities to drive progress towards universal health care, crystallizing new knowledge to drive transformative change. This is crucial. Without public sector capacity, you end up outsourcing everything to McKinsey. And then the, well, you're supposed to laugh because people aren't supposed to 
anyway. Um, so, you know, the consultification of governments is a problem. And it's not even the consulting company's fault themselves. If you stop investing within your own brain, there was a head of procurement in the NASA Apollo uh, program who said, if we stop investing within NASA, we won't even know who to collaborate with. We won't know how to write the terms of reference. And they had to collaborate with hundreds of companies to get to the moon. And he was very clear about that. They also, by the way, in the moon landing had a no excess profits clause. Because it was a collective investment, they were clear they had to actually share and not turn it into a gambling casino. No comment on what's currently happening with some of the vaccines. Third, finance, investing in health for all. We have two dimensions. And again, please read our new brief that's just come out, which Tedros did a wonderful job in quickly summing up. There's two bits there. How do we finance literally with new types of finance and new types of bold conditionalities as opposed to old Washington consensus conditionalities that actually created weaker capacity on the ground, but also that issue of budgeting, actually creating a much stronger and, and, and wider fiscal space as opposed to giving into the myths about, oh, there's no money. And then of course, money comes out of the woodwork, whether it's to go to war or during a pandemic, but that's too little, too late. If you've been under resourcing, under financing, under valuing our, our, our health systems, and then kind of condescendingly clap you know, for essential workers without knowing how to value and resource that essential part of the economy. And lastly, this issue around innovation. How do we truly you know, stop relying on you know, kind of donor and philanthropy mentality and produce, innovate, do business in a better way at the core of how we create value? And that really means paying a lot of attention to, again, not saying patents are bad, patents are fine, but how are, have we been governing the patent system, intellectual property rights? If we have allowed patents to go too upstream, so we're patenting the tools for research, too wide, because they're often just used for strategic reasons, and too strong, hard to license, well, that's, that's not exactly a productive entrepreneurship, that's unproductive entrepreneurship, as a famous economist, William Baumol, once argued. So I was gonna tell you all about our two briefs, but I have no time, they're on the website. And I'm sure we'll talk about it in our discussion. But can I just thank again, Dr. Tedros, for welcoming us, all these women to your council. And we promise to open up to other and the other sex. Um, and, and thank you so much, um, uh, Prime Minister Marine, for your inspiration, especially how you lead and how you also lead globally with your fellow sisters around this point about putting well-being at the center of how we do capitalism as opposed to a peripheral toy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mariana, and to those of you that are here in the room, but I guess also those that uh, are following online, uh, got a feeling for the energy that is in this council and uh, the very, very strong uh, motivation. And I think that's uh, a very special thing to uh, combine this kind of uh, positive energy with high professionalism and uh, deep knowledge. We are being joined now by uh, two of our fellow uh, commissioners, Vera Songwei. She is the United Nations Under Secretary General and Executive Secretary of the Economic Commission for Africa, and Jayati Ghosh, who is Professor of Economics at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. And uh, we welcome you. Hello, and uh, thank you for joining us uh, here today. Uh, sadly, uh, we did want to include a man in this panel, uh, the Minister of uh, Economy from Argentina, Martin Guzman, has had to cancel because, as you know, preparations for the G20 are ongoing. There are some very, very difficult issues on the agenda, and uh, he has to be part of those negotiations. So uh, this is why he is not, uh, not here with us. I wanted to turn to uh, Professor uh, Ghosh first, to Jayati, and just ask her, Jayati, uh, we have been, you know, approaching these incredibly senior women uh, like uh, yourselves to join this council, and uh, we wanted to hear from you to explain to the audience what was your motivation as, you know, one of the most busy women in the world uh, to join the council, to work with us, and uh, how you link this to your other work, particularly in relation to the broader UN SDG agenda, and something I think we'll come back to continuously during this discussion, the financing of global public goods. 
So uh, Jayati, over to you. Please share some of your thinking and your motivation with us. Thank you so much, Ilona. And it's really a terrific pleasure to be able to join you, even if only virtually. I think everybody would have realized already what would have made this council attractive because there is so much energy, passion, commitment that Mariana brings to everything she does that I think we all knew that this is not going to be just another commission. It's not going to be a talking shop where people just hold forth and then go home again. It's going to be trying to do something. And it's so critical to do something because I don't want to sound alarmist, but I really do feel that in some ways, you know, humanity is very fragile at the moment. We're really on the brink. Uh, the pandemic was, if you like, a kind of appetizer course for what is likely to follow. And uh, we know that we're already in the midst of climate change, which is going to unleash all kinds of new issues, including in health. And we know that things like this pandemic, first of all, will not go away easily, but could easily generate newer health threats of different kinds, all of which are made so much worse by inequality. So the need to be able to participate in ideas about how to change this, I think was absolutely central. And also because, again, I mean, it, as would have been obvious, because it's not just that uh, Mariana is, is very, uh, clear-minded and passionate, but also that she's quite very smart about it, and she's a lot of fun to work with, as we've all seen, means that uh, you can actually hope to do something that would be of benefit. And I think particularly, there was this feeling uh, that many of us had that, you know, the pandemic is generating all these short-term knee-jerk responses among governments in both the North and the South in different ways. Some of it is conditioned by the global financial architecture. Some of it is conditioned by the way in which governments have begun to think over the past two decades. Some of it is determined by the way markets and the private sector responds as well. But as a result, many of these responses were actually going against a long-term vision. And it's very clear that these short-term knee-jerk responses are not just not going to solve the problem, but they will make things worse for us. So we must have a transformative vision and we must link that transformative vision to what we're doing in the short term. I think already uh, Dr. Tedros and Mariana have laid out very clearly the kinds of issues that we will be looking at, the conceptual framing of this whole thing and how we want to uh, get into, delve into both the concepts that we use, the measurements and metrics that we use, but also all kinds of assumptions. So we are really thinking of revisioning the economic system in a doable way, not in some very airy fairy utopian way, but in a doable way. What are the practical things we need to do to take account of the interlinkages, to take account of the long-term requirements, to take account of the externalities and all of these things? I think that this focus on process is perhaps what is different from the discussion around, let's say, the SDGs because the SDGs are very desirable goals, but the process is not sufficiently taken apart and you know, sorted out. So you can't have a goal to achieve a particular thing if your entire financial architecture is encouraging markets and private finance to do exactly the opposite. And that governments are then forced to respond to that in particular ways that encourage more of that. Similarly, you can't have less inequality if you continue to allow a regulatory regime that enables massive rent seeking, including through the patent system that Mariana talked about and various other means. So I think this need to re-envision the economy and you know, as, as we keep saying in all our meetings, right? That we are thinking about health for all as the goal and we're looking at all the building blocks of that to get there. I think that's absolutely central and that automatically brings in the issue of inequality, which is pervasive in all of these things, but it also brings in specific mechanisms to reduce that inequality. So I think what I find also so exciting, uh, I'm really happy, I feel very privileged to be part of this council in a period when let's face it, not much in life makes you happy nowadays, right? But I feel very privileged to be part of this council because I really do feel that we are trying as a group to think about those building blocks in sustainable, doable ways, that different kinds of governments, different kinds of local institutions, different levels 
of international organization can take seriously and perhaps try and implement. Thank you very much, Jayati. Thank you for that. And without uh, having been here, you've uh, caught some of the spirit that's uh, been in all the halls uh, during this World Health Summit. Uh, that is, uh, you know, this feeling, uh, it's time to do something. We want to move from the words, those great words that have also come from many multilateral organizations from the G20s, the G7s of this world, uh, to action. And uh, we are trying all of us to sort of come together to define that action. Uh, but that action also needs to be rethought in terms of the process and in terms of that transformative vision. Now, I wonder if we have lost Vera. Mm. I don't see her on, uh, the, um, on the monitor. Vera, are you there? Oh, we've lost her. I hope she can come back. Uh, yes, Hi. there she is. Vera, wonderful. Uh, <laughs> welcome uh, to our meeting. Vera, we, would... I'm not lost Vera. Shall we speak to Madame Jenny? So, sure. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Vera. Wonderful. And we see you now again. Thank you so much. Vera, we were hoping that uh, you would outline to us, particularly with a view uh, of your work at the Economic Commission for Africa, how the kind of thinking that is being developed in the Economic uh, uh, Council has relevance for your work, has relevance for Africa, the countries of the Global South, and particularly the issue that uh, Mariana had mentioned uh, in her presentation as well, what are the new ways that we need to move forward in working together between public and private sectors? And again, particularly in the countries of the Global South. Could you share some of that thinking with us, please? Thank you. Thank you, Lana. Thanks uh, uh, again uh, for everybody who is participating in this uh, Global Wealth Health Summit. Um, of course, uh, I think that Mariana has uh, set up the, the stage very well and the energy in the room, I, 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 I take on JT's point, we would have all loved to be in the same room with Tedros and everybody, but uh, like they say in French, uh, uh, we will certainly see each other soon and hopefully uh, all together in one room. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. I think for Africa, what, what this crisis has done, it's, it has done two things. And, and uh, I think Mariana talked about the private sector but also I think the, 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 the need for, for some of the actions that are taken to be homegrown. And three things that we've done as, as a result of this crisis and for which I think that uh, this council is particularly important and hopefully that everybody can read, not just our last note, but all the, the other two, because each one of them is building on the other and I think makes the powerful points that we want to see in changing, I think the discourse around, first of all, uh, uh, you know, where health fits, uh, not health as a tool, but health as an end. To, to where we want to get to as a basic fundamental need. And if you look at that, then, you know, particularly on the African continent, one of the things that the crisis has brought to the fore is the fact that Africa's health security was totally in the hands of our external uh, partners. And so, you know, 95% of our pharmaceutical products were imported. And, and so Africa had no, 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 no sort of control over that. Secondly, when COVID hit, you know, yes, COVAX came together and COVAX said, you know, we're gonna help the continent, but again, you know, fully procuring all the vaccines from outside the continent. So not creating any jobs or the continent, not creating any reason for, for, for sort of the continent to be able to see, you know, how we take hold of, you know, taking care of our own health security. I think three things have since happened after that. Under the leadership of President Cyril Ramaphosa, we were able to create, first of all, the African Medical Supplies Platform. The key to markets is procurement, is that the buyer and the seller have a place where they meet and that markets can clear. And in Africa, we were not able to create these kinds of platforms where markets clear. Now with the African Medical Supplies Platform, we have created a pool procurement system that allows for markets to clear where countries can come together, buyers from across the world can come together, put their goods on it, but also we can then highlight and showcase African uh, uh, products in the pharmaceutical sector. And secondly, we are now doing more. What we saw is that many uh, of the Western pharmaceutical companies were not necessarily doing uh, vaccines for the diseases that afflicts the continent. 
And so we, need, we needed to make sure that we come back and take care of our own health security. And I think the whole conversation now around vaccine production for the continent is an important one. But one thing that we're saying is, and part of the work that this uh, commission I think is very important for us is to be able to send the message that Africa should not again be put to the side and saying, okay, yes, Africa, you produce vaccines for yourself. We need to be able to engage Africa in the global conversation because as COVID has shown us, if one of us is unvaccinated, all of us are still running a risk. And so essentially Africa must fit in that global supply chain. In a very weird way, this comes at a good time because Africa has just passed the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement. We are working to build supply chains on the continent. So in South Africa, we can you know, produce the vaccines. In, 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 in Rwanda, we can cup and field. In Egypt, we can ensure that the logistics system works and then we can send it out to the rest of the world. And I think that kind of private sector engagement in seeking a cure for and a solution for Africa's health crisis has been, I think, something that has emerged from this crisis, a particularly important uh, 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 discovery, I think, for the continent, but also not something, something that will also help us create jobs and ensure that the CFT and others work. But we have also been able to highlight, I think, some of the constraints that we maybe hitherto had not noticed, you know, export bans from the developed world when the crisis hit. Uh, I think are something that we must discuss as a global policy conversation. And, you know, yes, we also have now with from Taman and Larry Somers and Gozi, you know, the health uh, pandemic preparedness report that says we need to ensure that some things that we saw happen now don't happen again. And I think the first one is this kinds of export bans in times of crisis. We need to ensure that we don't put them in again. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vera. And this shows you know, the very important uh, issue of going at these problems and the transformative vision from these different perspectives and really being able to understand how policy decisions and what policy decisions are taken in the real world context of the Global South and what we can also learn from them in terms of uh, our assumptions and our uh, issues of, of trying to move forward. I have to change the program uh, because uh, some of you are very familiar with Berlin and some of you uh, are perhaps particularly familiar with Berlin Airport. Mm -hmm. And uh, the last thing you want to do is get there too late. Uh, uh, so you'll miss your flight. And uh, we have therefore been informed that uh, Dr. Tedros will not be able to stay right till the end of this meeting. Uh, because otherwise he will not get back in time uh, to uh, Geneva and he will miss his plane. So uh, we're just interrupting this very, very quickly to give Dr. Tedros the opportunity uh, to say goodbye and uh, to make an important announcement that he already made earlier in this summit. Uh, but this is important. We don't want uh, him to leave without having the word again. Please, Dr. Tedros. I actually wanted to stay with you, <laughs> uh, but as you said, it's a bit uh, risky also, I was told, otherwise I will miss uh, the flight. Uh, but I feel also bad to leave uh, while I'm enjoying the uh, meeting, plus uh, uh, before Her Excellency the Prime Minister. Um, just I would like to say a few, few things. One, um, to just say how very important this platform is. Uh, platform in a sense, the World Health Summit. And it brings civil society, private sector, government, academia uh, together. It's a special one. I have seen it growing for the last 13 years now. Uh, as you may know, um, I was a member of the founding steering committee. Um, then, um, of course, the, my appreciation to Detlef and, and Axel uh, for this really great idea. Uh, and together with that, one thing I would like to say is next year we have decided to do it joint WHO and World Health Summit uh, and hope to see you then. Not like a hybrid like now. I hope it will be a full uh, uh, conference or a full uh, summit. 
Um, the other issue, the second issue I'd like to raise is about the whole forum. I mean, summit was really excellent. And thank you to all of you for, um, the, you know, your comments, very uh, kind words uh, for WHO about strengthening WHO. And uh, that really gives us energy and inspiration. As um, Mariana said, uh, WHO is not perfect, makes mistakes um, like any organization, but at the same time, the key is learning from mistakes and moving, moving on. So thank you so much for the kind words, the support, the new ideas you have proposed, and we will implement the new ideas you proposed. Uh, then on um, um, G20 is coming, maybe I'd like to uh, say a couple of things. Uh, the main agenda now and our focus should be on ending this pandemic. The whole world is sick and tired, sick and tired. And we should, as one humanity, you know, unite to end this pandemic and bring our lives and livelihoods back, back, back to normal. So our focus, if our focus should be on ending the pandemic, then there is one thing that the G20 can do vaccinating the whole world. And there are targets we have already set for ourselves, 40% by the end of this year and 70% by middle of next year. I hope during this G20 summit, the G20 countries will own those targets and make sure that the 40% and 70% are achieved. And it's possible. It's in their hands. I mean, it's in the world's hands to make it happen. There is no excuse, no excuse at all. We have done all the analysis including the production capacity and so on is enough to vaccinate 40% by the end of this year. So I hope they will take that seriously. The second is, which is a bit disappointing and I will tell you why, um, a high level panel, different panels proposed a health threats financing board. Mm -hmm. This is for the next to prevent anything like this from happening and to have a solid sustainable financing for global health. But I see problems now and serious, uh, you know, differences between G220 countries. I understand there is trust deficit, but for the sake of humanity, the G20 should come together to make this excellent idea happen. Health Threats Financing Board has no political intentions as far as I understand. I have discussed this since its inception with experts. I think some of them are uh, here like, like uh, Victor, and of course, um, Vera is also a member of that, that committee and, and, and others. This could help for the next um, uh, steps, I mean, to prepare the world better, starting from today, by the way, if decided uh, it can uh, happen soon. So these are the two asks. Of course, there are the rest, but vaccinate the world and end the pandemic and at least have the health threats financing board for G20 that can help us to move forward as, as quickly as uh, uh, possible. Uh, finally, um, again, I, you know, thank you so much for the opportunity. I really learned a lot. I have attended many of the, the meetings and see you in 2022 uh, uh, by in the um, summit that will be hosted by World Health uh, Summit and, and WHO. Again, my appreciation and respect, great respect to Detlef and, and Axel. So Ilona, thank you. I have uh, taken a lot of time, but, <laughs> and I should have stayed, but I, you understand. So thank you so much. And thank Thanks you, Mariana. Very, very much. Thank you. And Thank you very much, Dr. Tedros. Thank you. We do hope really that you catch your flight. Mm -hmm. And I might say uh, I nearly didn't the other day. Uh, uh, but uh, I'd also like to say one thing on, on behalf of the organizers, and some of you might know that I'm co-chair of the World Health Summit Council, is uh, that it is absolutely extraordinary to have the Director General of the World Health Organization join this summit for its totality. Dr. Tedros was here for the opening for a range of the sessions and launches at this meeting, and he has been with us uh, 
uh, for this council, particularly because it is something that is so close to his heart and where he has very, very high expectations. So I think we owe him a very, very big thank you for that. So I'd like to go back to our discussions and uh, maybe I do turn to Vera because uh, the uh, Director General has uh, highlighted the proposal at the G20 for a Global Health Threats uh, Finance Board. And uh, I wonder, Vera, could you say a bit more about that for our audience? What is the intention of such a board? What would such a board add uh, to the mechanisms we already have? How would it improve finance? And uh, what are the issues that uh, are in the air right now where it seems that they will not be able to move forward? Are you there with us? I just see myself at the moment on the screen. <laughs> I see Jayati. Vera, can you come back to us? Mariana, would you like to comment on uh, the proposal? On that, well, yeah. Victor should. <laughs> Victor, <laughs> please. Uh, on that particular, I mean, I'll just say one thing yeah. that the whole point of our recent uh, brief that again was launched today was to say precisely that we need to structure the finance in particular ways. So maybe a very important point that hasn't been made strong enough is on how such a board would have to go beyond the status quo precisely in terms of the governance of the finance. And, and I don't know, I'm gonna say something a bit provocative maybe I shouldn't say it, but it might be that this lack of trust by some countries, which is then causing a stalemate in the G20 is precisely because of these problematic structures in the past. Uh, again, we, we label it in a lazy way, but we sort of know what we're talking about when we say the Washington consensus type institutions that were serving particular countries that some felt that they weren't necessarily benefiting from that. So I think maybe this is a moment to both warn that if we don't you know, implement this G20 proposal, it'll be a disaster for humanity and the history books will write about it as a massive failure, but also a wake up call that we need to talk about it, you know, hang our dirty laundry out a bit more explicitly that you know, the point this time around can't be just to increase the amount of finance, but we need to govern this for the common good in such a way that we haven't in the past. Jayati, could uh, you perhaps comment? Uh, it's been a, a theme that has been so central to the summit over the last two days, where so many people have been saying we need to move away from a charity model of global health. We need to move towards new uh, financing mechanisms. To some extent, it's something one has heard at regular intervals. Why do you think it is so difficult to move out of this uh, mind frame of the charity model. We're even seeing now with COVAX, where oh. there was originally a different intention of sharing, that it is also more or less being pushed back into the charity model. Mm. What needs to be changed? What could the council contribute uh, to uh, changing from such a charity model to a global public goods model? You know, this is such a, a tough issue, precisely because the reason that there's a fallback, if you like, to the charity model, is because of, in a sense, the lack of trust that comes from the unwillingness of, let's face it, not even G20, but G7 governments to actually ensure that if you do provide finance for these global public goods or to prevent global public bads, that the conditionalities will not be actually directed against people, but they will be directed in ways that uh, enable the public good. And I think that's absolutely critical. And it's a point that we make over and over again in the brief, that it's not just the quantity of finance, it is the quality of it, it's how we, it is regulated, it's how it's governed, it's the conditions under which it's provided. And it is what the private sector is not just encouraged and incentivized to do, but also the kinds of things that it's told it should not do and cannot do, if it is going to be part of that collective effort. I think there is a genuine concern among many countries that another global financing facility will once again be in the control of the great powers who will do that 
uh, who will use that power uh, to benefit their own private corporations. I mean, let me just put it very frankly. And that concern has to be met with very clear provisions in any financing facility that don't just say, well, you know, we are all going to donate this much or give this much, et cetera, but that actually see this as a global requirement, which is being met with a global response in a way that is uh, designed to make the private sector also conform to the public need and the public uh, requirements. On the issue of the charity model, there is also, again, I'm, I'm being a bit frank here, but you know, there are, there are concerns with the fact that a lot of the philanthropy has become disproportionately powerful in the global health architecture. And a lot of it sometimes contains quite blatant conflicts of interest, which cannot be controlled because there are no mechanisms to control it. These are all international flows. There's no architecture or no regulatory structure that would control those conflicts of interest. And that in turn also adds to a sense of distrust and concern. So I think if we are going to even let that, whatever remains of a so-called charity model survive, it would have to also be made to conform to the broader public good. A lot of it is, is too much dependent on the whims and, and interests of particular funders, which is not, I mean, of course it's not desirable overall, but it's not very productive in terms of generating the outcomes that are desired and required. So I, I think, you know, the reason why such a board, which I think would is obviously required and is essential, uh, may not be getting the kind of traction that it needs is because it's not just governments, but many people around the world are a little mistrustful of yet another finance, global financing facility that will end up serving the interests of capital based in certain countries rather than people around the world. Thank you, Jayati. And now that we have Vera back with us, uh, Vera, we'd like to ask you, you've been involved in the thinking around this a G20 uh, proposal around a global health finance board, global health threats board. Uh, could uh, you share with us some of the key elements of that so that our audience understands it and the view from Africa on such a board and what is actually holding up uh, moving forward in the G20 in relation to such a board? Could you share your thinking, please? And to unmute myself. Um, yes, no, thank you. I think the Global Finance and Health Board, um, the proposal is twofold. One is that, you know, normally uh, when finance ministers talk, they talk among themselves, when health ministers talk, they talk among themselves. And we, we're now beginning to see, you know, the importance of both of these uh, 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 bodies being able to talk together and, and, and come up with some solutions for how we solve this crisis. Because we will, we will and will only need to have a uh, collective solution to this crisis. Um, having a global sort of finance and health board that allows us to do one thing which is very important, finance insurance and finance the resilience that is needed. For that cost to happen, we do need to create the fiscal space. And that goes back to, I think, uh, uh, our finance ministers. We have seen, even with the G20 and the issuance of the SDRs, the SDRs are going to stay as a global uh, essentially, we're saying let them let's use them all as a reserve currency, but we need to buy vaccines, and so we are pushing now to online SDRs to be able to create a vaccines facility. Had we had a health and finance board, we would not be you know thinking about vaccine and vaccine purchase almost as an afterthought, right? It would have been an immediate thought. The second thing is about financing pandemic preparedness. We do need to be able to convince uh, when we do our budgets, and you know for budgets that go, go through a contestability process that financing the pandemic preparedness or financing the mitigation is just as important as financing uh, the pandemic itself. For, for that to happen, you do need health and finance ministers having that conversation upfront. Then so essentially ex ante and not ex post. And I think these are some of the kinds of issues that you know, we're hoping that a health and finance board, not a health financing board, but a health and financing board eventually will be able to address. Now. I, I think there is still some conversation around and, and, and uh, at least on the continent, do we want to create another institution or do we want to strengthen and maybe reshape existing institutions? And I think we do need some time because again, we, we tend to just create new institutions but maybe not solve the problem. I think that they are already existing, some existing institutions that could do the job 
just with revised mandates. And the pandemic has, I think, given us a mandate to be able to open some of the mandates of existing institutions and change them. So hopefully we can do that to have a place where we meet health. And in Africa, we're already meeting uh, constantly finance and health ministers. So I think the benefit of that for us is already very clear. We've spoken about pool procurement. We've talked about you know, setting the targets for how what percentage of the population needs to be vaccinated. We've, we've seen a little bit the changing knowledge that we've been acquiring throughout this COVID crisis because not, and not, none of us had full information of what this was when it began. And so what the cost of the financing of it was has been evolving over time. And the only way you can actually meet those costs is if health and finance ministers are talking together and sort of appreciating the change in the narrative at the same time. Thank you, Vera. Mariana, I'll come back to you and uh, along two lines. So the G20 is around the corner, a consensus, one thought one was going to get, uh, doesn't look uh, uh, that uh, rosy anymore. Maybe uh, diplomacy will uh, resolve it. Uh, we have uh, very different positions between uh, different uh, uh, powerful groupings on uh, the TRIPS waiver uh, for vaccines. Mm -hmm. We have big differences uh, on the proposal of a global health treaty. Uh, so on the one hand, there is this increasing need uh, for cooperation in the global arena and also cooperation that actually allows us to produce global public goods and finance them. On the other hand, there is this decoupling of uh, partly not even being able to talk to one another anymore and new red lines being drawn. Uh, you've, uh, and we have, you know, developed some proposals uh, now just uh, consciously just before the the g20 meeting we have our host country here germany taking on the g7 next year we have indonesia taking on the g20 i guess what i'm trying to lead to how do you think uh, also from the council we should be maneuvering this element between uh, economics and finance and uh, the transformative vision we've set and the really hardcore geopolitical issues uh, that are out there right now and that seem to make global cooperation more difficult than ever before. Hmm. Great question, big question. Um, I, th I think what's interesting is if you think back to 2015, it was a very, very different moment if we were you know, speaking today and it was then we would be talking about, we'd be, well, we would be congratulating the world and all these amazing things that were happening from the sustainable development goals having been agreed by basically every single country, um, the, the COP in Paris having happened and again, being very bold and also the changes that began since then around actually re-steering finance and having things like the, the finance stability board being set up precisely to make sure we don't get into another financial crisis, by the way, that hasn't worked. As I mentioned, we have managed to still financialize our economy to a large extent. So, but still back then there was, it, it was very positive. There was an optimistic moment. It was also a moment I was reflecting last night with Dr. Tedros that you could almost argue was a moment of convergence in the global conversation. So why now this divergence? And I think it's personally, and you know, I'm, I'm not a political scientist, but I do think there's something about, you know, putting too much emphasis on the geopolitical there's also something you know, strongly economic that it's simply not true that everyone is getting better, that everyone is profiting and benefiting from you know, the powers of digitalization or even the green transition, a really, really important um, area on the table. If you don't have a just transition, and this is something that of course the global trade unions are fighting for, then many people are left behind. And just think of the digital divide during COVID-19. You know, I've got four kids, they all still had access to their you know, human right to education, but so many kids globally during the lockdown did not have access to their human right to education because of the digital divide. So until we solve these structural problems of inequality, um, which you know are at every level, you know I see it in the city, I see it in London on the back of austerity, this huge wave of knife crime right now that we're having is on the back of inequality and certain people benefiting and some not from the best that the 21st century can offer us. So this moment around 
the wake up call of COVID-19, but also the IPCC report that this summer told us we got to hurry up. You know, it is becoming irreversible climate change. And then this G20 agreement that hopefully, Victor, you're, you and the team will diplomatically steer into place. These are moments to really reflect on what the actual tensions are. And it's too easy to blame you know, five countries that are gonna become bottlenecks to the system. Why is that? Why is there dis this discord? And by the way, in terms of this kind of convergence divergence, it's increasingly at the postcode level. It's not really anymore kind of global South and the North, you know, at the like, the New York metropolitan area is, in, is increasingly divergent. Again, the London metropolitan area, divergent. So this inequality literally at the postcode level is the way that also inequality is, is, is exhibiting itself. And so who's winning, you know, who owns what and why? You know, think of what's happening with, with big tech, you know, which has again made billions, if not trillions during the COVID pandemic. That's due to a lack of regulation. And, and you know, regulation of a system, which by the way, like with health, was publicly financed. What would Google be without its algorithm? It was NSF funded. What would you know, the, any of these companies be without the internet? It was publicly financed. What would Uber be without GPS? Publicly financed. We thought that just financing technology you know, and then kind of hoping for the best was gonna you know, do great. Instead, we know we need to govern the production, the innovation, and the system for the common good. And this is incredibly important with health. Um, you know, it was, it was a point I was making before. And of course, the vaccines themselves are not the mission. The mission is to globally vaccinate everyone, as Dr. Tedros has been saying. And so really making sure that, you know, at the G20, the moment is, you know, what is the mission? If we want to globally vaccinate everyone and get prepared for the next pandemic, which unfortunately, if you read the science, <laughs> is going to happen as the permafrost melts and all these viruses come out. It's not my expertise, but it is quite scary when you read that literature. What does it mean for learning the massive mistakes we've made in terms of not having capacity globally and in the global South then having to rely on charity because we just forgot to implement industrial strategies, which would allow distributed capacity to manufacture um, and, and, you know, uh, various points. So I'm just hoping that the wake up call sticks. And if it doesn't, you know, again, the history books are gonna write about this as a massive failure of humanity. And this is what the council is trying to do, which is to be a pain in the ass in the system <laughs> and to put out these uh, uh, briefings at critical moments, G7, G20, COP26, the IMF and World Bank meetings, but also then humbly trying to implement these changes on the ground and create sort of a coalition of the willing. And we have to remain optimist, otherwise, uh, what's the point? Thank you, Jayashi. Um, let me turn to you. We'd hoped, as you know, to have Minister Guzman here with us uh, to sort of uh, look into the mind of a finance minister. We can't do that now. But uh, since you have dealings with these kind of people, I wanted to ask you, what is it uh, that really convinces them? You know, frequently in the health uh, community that I belong to, there is this feeling, oh, if we only get our figures right, you know, we're going to tell these finance ministers, if you invest in health, you know, then this is really going to be great. You're going to make these savings. Uh, uh, it's all going to work out kind of thing. And uh, in the non-communicable disease area, in the infectious disease area, in all kinds of, you know, building health systems area, this argument has been put forward, but it hasn't really landed. So uh, what is it that would make uh, a new transformative kind of uh, economic model land uh, with uh, 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 ministers of finance and probably ministers of the economy? You know, there's a mix there, depending how countries divide their responsibilities. Here in Germany, our next chancellor is going to be a former uh, minister of finance. And uh, there's a big fight, you know, which uh, ministry will, which uh, party will get to be uh, the minister of finance. So uh, what makes them tick and how can one get them to think differently? We feel in the health community, our arguments haven't landed. Wow. Yes. Very simple question, Ilona, which I can answer. I'm known for my simple questions. <laughs> no. Okay. So let me put it this way. 
Uh, this might be a, a kind of divergent viewpoint, but I don't believe governments do things because they they suddenly see the light and and they become good. I think governments do things because you know there's pressure from below because they feel they have to for whatever reason. And so I think one of the big issues we have is not just changing the economic narrative, but changing in a way, if you like, the political narrative around all of these things. And I honestly was wrong. I believed that the pandemic would do a lot of this. I honestly thought that the pandemic would show everybody in the world that you know this that you cannot be nationalistic at a time like this because the virus doesn't respect you know borders and passports and visas so you really have to think globally I thought the pandemic would make people realize the huge value of care work and care workers and the need to invest much more significantly in care work I thought the pandemic would make people realize that it's not good enough to just for money, as Mariana has been saying, but you have to consider how that money is used and put conditions on how that money is used so that it is used for the common good. I thought the pandemic would make people realize that, you know, deregulated markets do not function to create resilient economies any more than they create healthy societies. So none of that happened, okay? I also thought that the international financial architecture would change in the sense that people would uh, people in the IMF, for example, which they certainly, the leadership seemed to recognize this, would realize that this is no time for austerity anywhere in the world, not just in the advanced economies, but in the countries that are asking for IMF assistance. None of that happened. Now, why did none of that happen? I think part of it is really because, you know, it, the, the, a lot of this reflects differential power. It reflects power imbalances. The people who have the voice and the ability to influence government policies are often a different category from you know citizens at large they are typically you know representing large corporations or global capital in different ways and so on but it's also that there wasn't enough pressure from below i think there wasn't widespread public demand for any of the things that i have mentioned and that in a sense is reflects our broader when i say us all of our broader failure to capture that narrative so i think we we have to think beyond just convincing governments. We have to think about convincing people that you cannot allow your government to do this because that's the only way in which we would actually get that kind of change. Having said that, it's also very urgent because these are not problems that in the, in the the even in the medium term, these are things that are out to get us right now, right? I mean, Mariana mentioned disease, but I, I don't know how many of uh, the, the cities, uh, the coastal cities of subcontinental India will be submerged. I mean, the kinds of diseases we are getting just because of climate change already, and the, na the changing nature of the pests that are impacting agriculture and therefore food and nutrition, all of that is already happening to us in the developing world. So we can't wait around for this. And yet we know that what we are asking is a big ask because the political forces against it are strong. So we need to mobilize a much larger coalition to actually get those things done. So final short answer, how do we do it? We can't do it by hanging on to our own little selves. We have to build coalitions. We have to work with people we don't like otherwise. We have to get in with groups, even on single point agendas, if that agenda is something we approve of. So basically we have to get out of our own comfortable shells and, and be willing to go out there and work with all kinds of people, get our hands dirty. I don't know if we're allowed to use hands anymore, but whatever it is. In, in this. <laughs> Thank you, Jayati and Vera. We're sort of coming close to the uh, end of this session. And uh, I'd like to first turn to Mariana and say, get our hands dirty. You said, you know, next phase of the commission, uh, get things done, bring change about. Uh, can you give the audience a bit of an idea of the kind of things you would think going forward? Sure. Well, our next brief is actually on value. And I think it'll be very, so the first one was on innovation for the common good, second financing and restructuring the finance. So you just don't you know, fill the system again with money thinking it's gonna help without restructuring it. And the third will be, how do we actually value um, care work, but also all, you know, the big debate about beyond GDP, how do we actually really start implementing better metrics, but also at the corporate level, you know, there's a lot of uh, discussions out there in terms of ESG, what is a, 
and, and we know there's a lot of greenwashing around that. How do we avoid the health washing if we start implementing things like ESGs around health? And I was just speaking to uh, Simia, who's running, co-running the, the Science Council about that. That might be actually a really interesting way for us to collaborate, because that's also something ahead. We'd like the Science Council that has also just been set up uh, in the Economics Council to work hand in hand. Um, so in terms of implementation, I think the really important thing will be, first of all, to make sure it's geographically spread that we're not just playing with the usual suspects like Finland, <laughs> as much as the idea really is to learn, learn from each other. And often these are not necessarily, as I said, national, these are sometimes like organizational um, at the project level. You know, I keep saying with, with, with these six different vaccines, there could there be the projects, the, the level of collaboration and design, for example, around agreements, around knowledge sharing, were actually very, very different between them. What can we learn from these differences? And so going beyond the ideology of government, the state, and just you know using something like the word, the vaccine and saying, no, let's get our hands dirty at the project level so we can start designing projects to be more symbiotic, mutualistic with common good kind of metrics at the center. So I think that really is something we wanna do because you can learn a lot from local projects, but the idea would be to scale them up and then scale them up so we start normalizing those lessons I mentioned procurement before, you know, in many developing parts of the world, the idea that you don't have enough money, well, let's start actually restructuring also the existing money to be really, again, outcomes oriented instead of just handouts to different uh, sectors. The life sciences sector, by the way, is in many parts of the advanced world, a sector that receives lots of subsidies and guarantees and again, investment from government. What does it mean not to focus on sectors, but look at health outcomes as an intersectoral approach. This is what we mean by that mission oriented approach that I mentioned before. So I think we want to, again, start doing that in terms of bringing the council's ideas to the table in different parts of the world and then learn uh, and, and start scaling up those lessons. So start small, but then scale up for how we actually can redesign the economy to be outcomes oriented. Thank you, Marianne. And for all of you, we are already thinking together with Dr. Tedros and the World Health Summit how the agendas where we've only, you know, really been able to tip at them will uh, get much more space at next year's World Health Summit that we can present them, discuss them, uh, dig into depth. I also want to say I'm well aware that uh, some uh, uh, participants have written actually quite long uh, commentaries mm -hmm. uh, on our discussions, we will use them, we will pass them on. So uh, thank you for uh, spending that time and, and taking that, uh, that effort. But we see that around the economy, that around uh, the uh, interface between innovation industry and the public sector, between financing global public goods and uh, development aid, etc. There is so much that needs to be clarified, so much that we need to take forward and hopefully can inject into the G7 and G20 uh, discussions. And that if uh, the member states of WHO agree uh, to move forward with a, a pandemic treaty will also be part of those negotiations for the uh, financial responsibilities. So uh, this is just uh, a taster. We really hope you go to the website of the council uh, and that uh, you read the briefs and the materials. But I also want to say, take the time uh, to look at uh, the CVs of the extraordinary women economists in this council, read their work. Uh, it is really absolutely extraordinary what can be learned from that and might open some new vistas for you already now. And it's my great pleasure to ask Her Excellency the Prime Minister to give some concluding comments. Please, Prime Minister. Dear friends, thank you so much for very interesting presentations and, and comments on the issue. Today, I would like to conclude uh, with, with the words that Dr. Tetra said, now our main goal is to end the pandemic. And we cannot be short-sighted when doing so. We have to look forward. Um, I think I'm a politician. I'm a prime minister, so I'm a politician. And actually nations are are in difficult position 
when it comes uh, to the trust of the citizens, because of course every uh, leader in the country want to make sure that they will get their own people vaccinated, their own citizens vaccinated. This is their responsibility as leaders, as, as, as governments. But if we cannot vaccinate the whole population, if we cannot look forward uh, to the future uh, and, and not only uh, be so short-sighted when it comes to our own needs as, as nations, then we are losing the game. We are losing the game because if we don't get everyone vaccinated, the virus will stay, it will mutate, and then we have to vaccinate everyone once again. Uh, and this is something that we have to learn from this pandemic. We have to look forward, we have to look uh, farther, uh, farther away, not, not only what is in front of us right now. And we need cooperation and we need trust. Uh, one thing that, that we have learned in Finland, why we did cope so well uh, during the pandemic, of course, there are many reasons, but one, one reason is that we have a trust in, a, in our society. We did uh, make uh, a clear goal uh, when the pandemic spread. Uh, we put uh, the health of people uh, in, in the forefront. This was our goal, to protect health, to protect life. And as we can see, our economy also did better than in, different, in many different countries because we put people's health and, and life first. We, we didn't dip uh, as low as many other countries when it comes to economy, because when we protected people's health and, and life, uh, our economy also survived much better. And another reason why we did so well is the trust of society. And we have built the trust in our society for so long time, for decades. Uh, one thing that is, that is important is that we have a welfare society that we have built it over decades. We have built, built it in a way that we have put people's well-being in the center. We have built our society in a way that it's equal. We have thought that, that it's, it's not enough that some are doing well. Everybody needs to do well. And we are only as strong as the weakest points in our society. And this is something that builds trust in, in Finland and also other Nordic countries. And also the thing that was mentioned in this discussion was to cooperate with people that you don't uh, see eye to eye, that you think differently. It's very important to trying to find compromises and consensus also with people that thinks differently. This is also something that builds trust. In Finland, we have had, this is one example, coalition governments forever. We have now five parties in our government different political parties with different ideologists, different way of doing things. But we have, uh, even though this is so, we have been able to build, build a strong society with working together. And this is something that Finland is known for, uh, working together with people that think differently. I think the learns that the things that we have to learn uh, from this pandemic is to cooperate, is to build well-being, put people's health and well-being first, trying to build our societies in a way that are more equal. And this is also something that will benefit the economy. This is the, the lesson that we have to learn, to put people's well-being and health first, well-being, build our economies stronger, more resilient, more prepared for all the major challenges that we are facing the health challenges of the world globally, but also climate change, the loss of biodiversity, all the inequalities, poverty. To put people first is something that we have to do if we want to make, make a better life for ourselves, for our children, uh, for, for everyone uh, in, in the globe, not only the rich, not only the West, but everyone. And now we have to fight uh, this pandemic to make sure that everybody will get vaccinated because if we don't do that, we are all worse off. This is my closing words. Thank you so much for the in, in, interesting uh, discussion, for your presentations. And, and we, are, uh, we are fighting uh, this pandemic together and, and we will make sure that, that we will learn from our mistakes that we have made during this, this crisis and we will do better next time. Thank you.
Thank you, Prime Minister. I think that was a wonderful message uh, to end this World Health Summit with uh, really understanding why we come together here, what our mission and our goal is. We thank you very much for those words, for the focus on equity, the focus on working together, and something that has come up continuously in our discussions, how do we establish trust in our societies? and where the governance uh, is uh, very much linked uh, to the well-being and uh, the moving forward uh, together. And I guess, you know, some of the people that are presently involved in negotiating a coalition government in Germany uh, might well have listened to you. It's only three parties here, uh, but uh, still it's a novel thing for Germany and uh, will be a, a big and an interesting challenge because it allows for innovation that we have not been able uh, to have before. So thank you to all of you for staying until the end. Uh, I think it was well worth it. You heard uh, an e excellent presentations from, I hope, our council. I hope you benefited. And I think we had uh, wonderful input from our patron and from Dr. Tedros. Thank you very much again. Have a good trip home. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you.